What leads a person to betray their duty and trust? For Scott Topham, it began in May 2021. In the quiet corners of Spring Hill Prison, a scheme was brewing. Isaac Hoeta, a Black Power prisoner, eyed then-officer Scott Topham and saw an opportunity. He approached Topham with a proposition, smuggle contraband into the prison and receive a hefty cash reward in return. It was a tempting offer for Topham who was struggling with money troubles. The sum? A cool $3,200? But what if Topham refused? What if he started asking questions? Hueta had already thought of that. He and his fellow co-offender Yamin Kavina, who was not a prisoner, had a plan. The details of this backup strategy remain unknown, but it was clear they were prepared for any eventuality. However, to their satisfaction, Topham agreed. He decided to trade his integrity and duty for cash. Unbeknownst to him, this decision would mark the beginning of his downfall. While it remains unclear exactly what was in those first two packages that Topham smuggled in, the transaction was successful and Topham pocketed the money. Topham took the bait, setting in motion a series of events that would lead to his downfall. As we shall see, this was the start of a destructive spiral that would not only cost Topham his job, but also his reputation and freedom. With the agreement in place, Topham took his first step into the abyss. The stage was set for the first exchange, a rendezvous at the Mercer Mobile, a place teeming with unsuspecting patrons, oblivious to the transaction about to take place. In the midst of the ordinary, Topham and Jamin Kawena, the gang prospect, found each other. Topham, donning his Department of Corrections uniform, used it not as a symbol of justice, but as a beacon to identify himself in the crowd. An ironic twist indeed with the uniform meant to uphold order being used as a cloak for deceit. The package, meticulously wrapped as instructed, changed hands. A thousand dollars, the price for Topham's integrity, exchanged for a parcel of unknown contents. How little did that uniformed figure at Mercer Mobile know? His life was about to take a drastic turn. And yet it wasn't a single event, but the start of a series. On June 1st, a call came from Isaac Hueta, the imprisoned Black Power member, through Kawina. Another package, another sum of money, another dent in Topham's crumbling ethics. $1,200 this time, delivered on June 7th, part of its contents reaching Hueta behind the prison walls. But the wheel of clandestine deals didn't stop there. A third consignment was arranged, another $1,200 promised. Topham, now accustomed to this dangerous dance, had the package in his vehicle as he arrived at the prison on July 7th. Yet Topham still had the audacity to maintain a facade of innocence. When cornered, he admitted to having cannabis but claimed it was for personal use a feeble attempt to veil his actions, to hold on to the remnants of a rapidly fading credibility. Little did Topham know this clandestine meeting was just the beginning. As the weeks passed, Topham found himself sinking deeper into the world of contraband smuggling. The second delivery was not much different from the first. It was a routine that was becoming all too familiar and all too comfortable. In the wake of the first successful exchange, a second request came from Isaac Hoyta. The gears of their illicit operation were turning smoothly, and Topham found himself once more agreeing to smuggle in another package. This time, the price tag was $1,200, a sum that, though substantial, was a drop in the ocean compared to the risk that he was taking. The package, much like the first, was carefully wrapped and prepared for its journey into the prison. It was handed over to Topham, who once again donned his Department of Corrections uniform, acting as a wolf in a shepherd's clothing. His role was clear and the stakes were high, but the lure of quick cash proved too strong. Upon delivery, a portion of the package's contents found its way to Hoita. The substance, hidden and smuggled within the prison's walls, began to circulate, further endangering the inmates and the staff. Topham, in his pursuit of easy money, was blurring the lines between right and wrong, disregarding the very laws he was sworn to uphold. Yet with each successful delivery, Topham was not stepping closer to a life of luxury, but rather, he was unknowingly drawing closer to his inevitable downfall. His actions hidden in the shadows were about to be thrust into the glaring light of justice. And when that light finally found him, there would be nowhere left to hide. The lure of easy money proved too much for Topham, leading him to make one fatal mistake. The third consignment was an arrangement that seemed like business as usual for Topham. He was once again paid $1,200, a sum that had become all too familiar for the former corrections officer. With the package safely in his vehicle, he set off for Spring Hill Prison, unaware of the impending disaster. On the fateful day of July 7th, 
the prison was conducting a routine vehicle checkpoint. Unbeknownst to Topham, this checkpoint was about to become the turning point of his life. As the officers approached his vehicle, his heart pounded in his chest. He knew what he had in his possession, and he knew the risks. But it was too late to turn back now. When the officers discovered the package, Topham was cornered. He admitted to having cannabis on him, but in a feeble attempt to mitigate the situation, he claimed it was for personal use. But the officers were not fooled. They had found a package, heavily wrapped in cling film and duct tape, containing a cocktail of illicit substances. The truth was staring him in the face, and there was no escaping it. The contents of the package were shocking. It contained 1.75 grams of methamphetamine, 21.1 grams of cannabis, 15.8 grams of synthetic cannabis, and 163.5 grams of tobacco. Topham's illicit business was not just a minor transgression, it was a serious breach of trust, undermining the very system he was supposed to uphold. Despite his attempts to downplay the situation, the reality was undeniable. The former corrections officer had been caught red-handed, smuggling contraband into the prison he was entrusted to protect. His actions were not just reckless, they were criminal. Topham's reckless actions had finally caught up with him. In court, Topham faced the consequences of his actions. He was initially set to fight three charges of corruption, one of possession of cannabis, and two of possession of unauthorized items. However, just a week before his trial was set to begin in February, he changed his tune and pleaded guilty. The court heard the narrative of his transgressions, a tale of trust broken and duties discarded. Crown solicitor Amy Alcock took the floor next, painting a picture of a man who was willfully blind to the contents of the packages he smuggled. Even though it couldn't be proven what was in the first two packages, Alcock argued that Topham was fully aware of the illicit nature of his deeds. He knew he was smuggling contraband into the prison, yet he chose to turn a blind eye. Topham, a corrections officer, held a position of trust. He was trained to prevent the very corruption he was now standing trial for. Alcock asserted that Topham's actions had undermined the integrity of the prison system. Not only had he put himself at risk, but he had also endangered his fellow staff and the prisoners he was sworn to protect. The court listened, silent and attentive, as Alcock described how Topham had been trained on getting got, the process of being bribed by a prisoner. She stated, that's what happened here, he was got. Topham's betrayal of trust had not only put himself in jeopardy, but also undermined the prison system. His actions echoed through the halls of justice, a stark reminder of the consequences of corruption and the importance of integrity in upholding the law. Despite the evidence against him, Topham's counsel tried to mitigate the damage. Mark Strum, a seasoned attorney, took the stand, battling against the tide to keep his client out of prison. His argument was a plea for understanding, a call to consider the circumstances that led to Topham's downfall. Strum painted a picture of a man who was relatively inexperienced in his job as a corrections officer. He had dealt with some troubling cases, cases that might have left a less resilient man shaken, he was, after all, human, susceptible to the stresses and strains of a challenging profession. Furthermore, Strum drew attention to Topham's financial predicament. Money problems had plagued him, adding to the weight of his professional burdens. Strum argued that this combination of inexperience, unsettling experiences, and financial distress had pushed Topham into a corner. But it wasn't just about providing reasons for Topham's actions. Strum highlighted Topham's own admission of his folly. Topham had called himself an idiot, a poignant moment that underscored his regret and acceptance of his wrongdoings. He hadn't denied his actions, nor had he tried to shirk responsibility. Strum argued that Topham didn't know the full extent of what he was smuggling. He admitted to being aware of the cannabis, but claimed ignorance about the methamphetamine. Topham, according to Strum, was willfully blind, but not maliciously complicit. In a final attempt at mitigation, Strum pointed out the low amount of money Topham received. He had lost his career, his reputation, his previous good character, all for a sum that hardly seemed worth the consequences. It was a desperate act, born out of desperation, not greed. But no amount of reasoning could change the fact that Topham had betrayed his duty. The damage was done, the trust broken. Topham's fall from grace was a stark reminder of the consequences of straying from the path of duty and integrity. Topham's actions had far-reaching consequences, both for himself and for the prison system. In the aftermath of his actions, Topham's world crumbled around him. 
His career in the Department of Corrections, once a source of pride and stability, was irretrievably tarnished. His reputation was stained with the ink of corruption and betrayal, and his previous good character was overshadowed by the shadow of his wrongdoings, but the impact of Topham's actions stretched beyond his personal life. His decision to smuggle contraband into the prison, not once but thrice, shook the very foundations of trust and security within the prison system. It's a system that relies heavily on the integrity of its officers, and Topham's actions undermined that integrity, putting staff and fellow prisoners at risk. Moreover, his actions highlighted a gaping vulnerability within the prison system. Despite having received training on how to resist bribes from prisoners, Topham was easily persuaded to smuggle in illegal substances. This raises questions about the effectiveness of the training provided to corrections officers and the measures in place to prevent such incidents. As a corrections officer, Topham held a position of trust. He was expected to uphold the law and maintain order within the prison, but his actions not only breached that trust, but also eroded the faith that society places in individuals who are tasked with such responsibility. Additionally, Topham's downfall has served to reinforce the importance of integrity and duty within the prison system. It underscores the need for corrections officers to remain vigilant and steadfast in the face of potential corruption and to uphold the values and principles they are sworn to protect. In the end, Topham's story is a tragic one. A man who once held a position of trust and respect found himself on the wrong side of the law, his career and reputation in ruins. But it also serves as a cautionary tale, a stark reminder of the dire consequences of betraying trust and duty. Topham's downfall serves as a stark reminder of the consequences of betraying trust and duty.